Pericardium and Heart Introduction, pericardium, comprising fibrous and serous layers, encloses the heart pulsating from womb to tomb. Heart is a vital organ, pumping blood to the entire body. Its pulsations are governed by the brain through various nerves. Since heartbeat is felt or seen against the chest wall, it appears to be more active than the quiet brain controlling it. That is why there are so many songs on the heart and few on the brain. Meditation, yoga, and exercise help in regulating the heartbeat through the brain. Dissection Make a vertical cut through each side of the pericardium immediately anterior to the line of the phrenic nerve. Join the lower ends of these two incisions by a transverse cut approximately 1 cm above the diaphragm. Turn the flap of pericardium upwards and sideways to examine the pericardial cavity. See that the turned flap comprises fibrous and parietal layer of visceral pericardium. The pericardium enclosing the heart is its visceral layer, Fig 18.1a. Pass a probe from the right side behind the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk till it appears on the left just to the right of left atrium. This probe is in the transverse sinus of the pericardium. Lift the apex of the heart upwards. Put a finger behind the left atrium into a cul-de-sac, bounded to the right and below by inferior vena cava and above and to left by lower left pulmonary vein. This is the oblique sinus of pericardium. Define the borders, surfaces, grooves, apex and base of the heart. Features The pericardium, Greek around heart, is a fibrosorous sac which encloses the heart and the roots of the great vessels. It is situated in the middle mediastinum. It consists of the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium, figs 18.1b and 18.2. Fibrous pericardium encloses the heart and fuses with the vessels which enter slash leave the heart. Heart is situated within the fibrous and serous pericardial sacs. As heart develops, it invaginates itself into the serous sac, without causing any breach in its continuity. The last part to enter is the region of atria, from where the visceral pericardium is reflected as the parietal pericardium. Thus parietal layer of serous pericardium gets adherent to the inner surface of fibrous pericardium, while the visceral layer of serous pericardium gets adherent to the outer layer of heart and forms its epicardium. Fibrous pericardium Fibrous pericardium is a conical sac made up of fibrous tissue. The parietal layer of serous pericardium is attached to its deep surface. The following features of the fibrous pericardium are noteworthy. 1. The apex is blunt and lies at the level of the sternal angle. It is fused with the roots of the great vessels and with the pretrachial fascia. 2. The base is broad and inseparably blended with the central tendon of the diaphragm. 3. Anteriorly, it is connected to the upper and lower ends of body of the sternum by weak superior and inferior sternopericardial ligaments, Fig 18.3. 4. Posteriorly, it is related to the principal bronchi, the esophagus with the nerve plexus around it and the descending thoracic aorta. 5. On each side, it is related to the mediastinal pleura, the mediastinal surface of the lung, the phrenic nerve, and the pericardiac phrenic vessels. 1. It protects the heart against sudden overfilling and prevents overexpansion of the heart. Serous pericardium. Serous pericardium is thin double-layered serous membrane lined by mesothelium. The outer layer or parietal pericardium is fused with the fibrous pericardium. The inner layer or the visceral pericardium, or epicardium is fused to the heart, except along the cardiac grooves, where it is separated from the heart by blood vessels. The two layers are continuous with each other at the roots of the great vessels, i.e. ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk, two vena cavi, and four pulmonary veins. The pericardial cavity is a potential space between the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. It contains only a thin film of serous fluid which lubricates the apposed surfaces and allows the heart to beat smoothly. Sinuses of pericardium. The epicardium at the roots of the great vessels is arranged in form of two tubes. The arterial tube encloses the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk at the arterial end of the heart tube, and the venous tube encloses the vena cavi and pulmonary veins at the venous end or the heart tube. 
the passage between the two tubes is known as the transverse CBS of pericardium. During development, to begin with, the veins of the heart are crowded together. As the heart increases in size and these veins separate out, a pericardial reflection surrounds all of them and forms the oblique pericardial cysts. This cul-de-sac is posterior to the left atrium, fig 18.4. The trans rare situs is a horizontal gap between the arterial and venous ends of the heart tube. It is bounded anteriorly by the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk, and posteriorly by the superior vena cava and inferiorly by the left atrium, on each side it opens into the general pericardial cavity, fig 18.5. The oblique sinus is a narrow gap behind the heart. It is bounded anteriorly by the left atrium, and posteriorly by the parietal pericardium and esophagus. On the right and left sides it is bounded by reflections of pericardium as shown in Fig 18.5. Below, and to the left, it opens into the rest of the pericardial cavity. The oblique sinus permits pulsations of the left atrium to take place freely. Contents of the pericardium One heart with cardiac vessels and nerves. Two ascending aorta. 3 pulmonary trunk 4 lower half of the superior vena cava 5 terminal part of the inferior vena cava 6 the terminal parts of the pulmonary veins blood supply the fibrous and parietal pericardia are supplied by branches from l internal thoracic 2 musculophrenic arteries 3 the descending thoracic aorta 4 veins drain into corresponding veins nerve supply the fibrous and parietal pericardia are supplied by the phrenic nerves. They are sensitive to pain. The epicardium is supplied by autonomic nerves of the heart, and is not sensitive to pain. Pain of pericarditis originates in the parietal pericardium alone. On the other hand, cardiac pain or angina originates in the cardiac muscle or in the vessels of the heart. Collection of fluid in the pericardial cavity is referred to as pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. The fluid compresses the heart and restricts venous filling during diastole. It also reduces cardiac output. Pericardial effusion can be drained by puncturing the left fifth or sixth intercostal space just lateral to the sternum, or in the angle between the xiphoid process and left costal margin, with the needle directed upwards, backwards, and to the left. Fig 18.6. In mitral stenosis left atrium enlarges and compresses the esophagus causing dysphagia. Features. The heart is a conical hollow muscular organ situated in the middle mediastinum. It is enclosed within the pericardium. It pumps blood to various parts of the body to meet their nutritive requirements. The Greek name for the heart is cardia from which we have the adjective cardia. The Latin name for the heart is COR from which we have the adjective coronary. The heart is placed obliquely behind the body of the sternum and adjoining parts of the costal cartilages, so that one-third of it lies to the right and two-thirds to the left of the median plane. The direction of blood flow, from atria to the ventricles is downwards forwards and to the left. The heart measures about 12 x 9 cm and weighs about 300 g in males and 250 g in females. External features. The human heart has four chambers. These are the right and left atria and the right and left ventricles. The atria, Latin chamber, lie above and behind the ventricles. On the surface of the heart, they are separated from the ventricles by an atrioventricular groove. The atria are separated from each other by an interatrial groove. The ventricles are separated from each other by an interventricular groove which is subdivided into anterior and posterior parts, fig 18.7. The heart has, an apex directed downwards forwards and to left. A base, posterior surface, directed backwards and inferiorly. Anterior, sternocostal. Inferior and left lateral surface. The surfaces are demarcated by upper, inferior, right, and left borders. Grooves or sulci. The atria are separated from the ventricles by a circular atrioventricular or coronary sulcus. It is divided into anterior and posterior parts. Anterior part consists of right and left halves. Right half is oblique between right auricle and right ventricle, 
lodging right coronary artery. Left part is small between left auricle and left ventricle, lodges circumflex branch of left coronary. The coronary sulcus is overlapped anteriorly by the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. The infratrial groove is faintly visible posteriorly, while anteriorly it is hidden by the aorta and pulmonary trunk. The anterior interventricular groove is nearer to the left margin of the heart. It runs downwards and to the left. The lower end of the groove separates the apex from the rest of the inferior border of the heart. The posterior interventricular groove is situated on the diaphragmatic or inferior surface of the heart. It is nearer to the right margin of the surface, Fig 18.8. The two interventricular grooves meet at the inferior border near the apex. The crux of the heart is the point where posterior interventricular sulcus meets the coronary sulcus. Apex of the heart. Apex of the heart is formed entirely by the left ventricle. It is directed downwards, forwards, and to the left and is overlapped by the anterior border O1 the left lung. It is situated in the left fifth intercostal space 9 cm lateral to the midsternal line just medial to the midclavicular line. In the living subject, pulsations may be seen and felt over this region, Fig 18.7. In children below 2 years, apex is situated in the left 4th intercostal space in midclavicular line. Normally the cardiac apex or apex beat is on the left side. In the condition called dextrocardia, the apex is on the right side, Fig 18.9. Dextrocardia may be part of a condition called SIFS inversus in which all thoracic and abdominal viscera are a mirror image of normal base of the heart. The base of the heart is also called its posterior surface. It is formed mainly by the left atrium and by a small part of the right atrium. In relation to the base one can see the openings of four pulmonary veins which open into the left atrium, and of the superior and inferior vena cavi, Latin, empty vein, which open into the right atrium. It is related to thoracic 5 to thoracic 8 vertebrae in the lying posture, and descends by one vertebra in the erect posture. It is separated from the vertebral column by the pericardium, the right pulmonary veins, the esophagus and the aorta. Borders of the heart one the upper border is slightly oblique, and is formed by the two atria, chiefly the left atrium. Two the right border is more or less vertical and is formed by the right atrium. It extends from superior vena cava to inferior vena cava, IVC. 3. The inferior border is nearly horizontal and is formed mainly by the right ventricle. A small part of it near the apex is formed by left ventricle. It extends from IVC to apex. 4. The left border is oblique and curved. It is formed mainly by the left ventricle, and partly by the left auricle. It separates the anterior and left surfaces of the heart, Fig 18.7. It extends from apex to left auricle. Surfaces of the heart. The anterior or sternocostal surface is formed mainly by the right atrium and right ventricle, and partly by the left ventricle and left auricle, Fig 18.15. The left atrium is not seen on the anterior surface as it is covered by the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Most of the stemocostal surface is covered by the lungs, but a part of it that lies behind the cardiac notch of the left lung is uncovered. The uncovered area is dull on percussion. Clinically it is referred to as the area of superficial cardiac dullness. The inferior or diaphragmatic str ace rests on the central tendon of the diaphragm. It is formed in its left two-thirds by the left ventricle, and in its right one-third by the right ventricle. It is traversed by the posterior interventricular groove, and is directed downwards and slightly backwards, Fig 18.8. The left surface is formed mostly by the left ventricle, and at the upper end by the left auricle. In its upper part, the surface is crossed by the coronary sulcus. It is related to the left phrenic nerve, the left pericardiacophrenic vessels, and the pericardium. Types of circulation There are two main types of circulations, systemic and pulmonary. Table 18.1 shows their comparison. Right atrium Dissection. Cut along the upper edge of the right auricle by an incision from the anterior end of the superior vena cable opening to the left side. 
similarly cut along its lower edge by an incision extending from the anterior end of the inferior vena cable opening to the left side. Incise the anterior wall of the right atrium near its left margin and reflect the flap to the right, Fig 18.10. On its internal surface, see the vertical crista terminalis and horizontal pectinate muscles. The fossa ovalis is on the interatrial septum and the opening of the coronary sinus is to the left of the inferior vena cable opening. Define the three cusps of tricuspid valve. Position. The right atrium is the right upper chamber of the heart. It receives venous blood from the whole body, pumps it to the right ventricle through the right atrioventricular or tricuspid opening. It forms the right border, part of the upper border, the sternocostal surface and the base of the heart, Fig 18.7. It to the right ventricle through the right atrioventricular or tricuspid opening. It forms the right border, part of the upper border, the sternocostal surface and the base of the heart, Fig 18.7. External features 1 The chamber is elongated vertically, receiving the superior vena cava at the upper end and the inferior vena cava at the lower end, Fig 18.11. The upper end is prolonged to the left to form the right auricle, Latin if here. The auricle covers the root of the ascending aorta and partly overlaps the infundibulum of the right ventricle. Its margins are notched and the interior is sponge-like, which prevents free flow of blood. 2. Along the right border of the atrium there is a shallow vertical groove which passes from the superior vena cava above to the inferior vena cava below. This groove is called the SX psychus terminalis. It is produced by an internal muscular ridge called the crista terminalis, Fig 18.11. The upper part of the sulcus contains the sinuatrial or SA node which acts as the pacemaker of the heart. 3. The right atrioventricular groove separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. It is more or less vertical and lodges the right coronary artery and the small cardiac vein. Tributaries or inlets of the right atrium, 1. Superior vena cava. 2. Inferior vena cava. 3. Coronary sinus. 4. Anterior cardiac veins. 5. Vena cordis minimi, the Bizian veins. 6. Sometimes the right marginal vein right atrioventricular orifice. Blood passes out of the right atrium through the right atrioventricular or tricuspid orifice and goes to the right ventricle. The tricuspid orifice is guarded by the tricuspid valve which maintains unidirectional flow of blood, Fig 18.11. Internal features. The interior of the right atrium can be broadly divided into the following three parts. Smooth posterior part of right atrium 1 Developmentally it is derived from the right horn of the sinus venosus. 2 Most of the tributaries except the anterior cardiac veins open into it. A The superior vent cava opens at the upper end. B The inferior vena cava opens at the lower end. The opening is guarded by a rudimentary valve of the inferior vena cava or eustachian value. During embryonic life the valve guides the inferior vena cable blood to the left atrium through the foramen ovale. See the coronary sinus opens between the opening of the inferior vena cava and the right atrioventricular orifice. The opening is guarded by the valve of the coronary sinus or Thebesian value. The vena cordis minimi are numerous small veins present in the walls of all the four chambers. They open into the right atrium through small foramina. 3. The interven zero us tubercle of lower is a very small projection, scarcely visible, on the posterior wall of the atrium just below the opening of the superior vena cava, during embryonic life it directs the superior cable blood to the right ventricle. Rough anterior part or pectinate part including, the auricle, 1. Developmentally it is derived from the primitive atrial chamber. 2. It presents a series of transverse muscular ridges called museum pectinati, Fig 18.11. They arise from the crista terminalis and run forwards and downwards towards the atrioventricular orifice, giving the appearance of the teeth of a comb. In the auricle, the muscles are interconnected to form a reticular network. Interatrial septum. L. Developmentally it is derived from the septum primum and septum secundum. 2. It presents the fossa ovalis, a shallow saucer-shaped depression, in the lower part. The fossa represents the site of the embryonic septum primum. 3. The annulus ovalis or limb hus, 
Latin a border, fossa ovalis is the prominent margin of the fossa ovalis. It represents the lower free edge of the septum secundum. It is distinct above and at the sides of the fossa ovalis, but is deficient inferiorly. Its anterior edge is continuous with the left end of the valve of the inferior vena cava. For the remains of the foramen ovale are occasionally present. This is a small slit-like valvular opening between the upper part of the fossa and the limbus. It is normally occluded after birth, but may sometimes persist. Right ventricle. Dissection. In size along the ventricular aspect of right AV groove, till you reach the inferior border. Continue to incise along the inferior border till the inferior end of anterior interventricular groove. Next cut along the infundibulum. Now the anterior wall of right ventricle is reflected to the left to study its interior. Position. The right ventricle is a triangular chamber which receives blood from the right atrium and pumps it to the lungs through the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries. It forms the inferior border and a large part of the sternocostal surface of the heart, Fig 18.7. External Features 1. Externally, the right ventricle has two surfaces anterior or sternocostal and inferior or diaphragmatic. 2. The interior has two parts, a. The rejoining part is rough due to the presence of muscular ridges called trabeculi carnii. It develops from the proximal part of bulbous cortis of the heart tube. B. The outowing port or infundibulum is smooth and forms the upper conrical part of the right ventricle which gives rise to the pulmonary trunk. It develops from the mid portion of the bulbous cortis. The two parts are separated by a muscular ridge called the supraventricular crest or infundibuloventricular crest situated between the tricuspid and pulmonary orifices. Internal Features 1. The interior show two orifices, a the right atrioventricular or tricuspid orifice, guarded by the tricuspid valve. b. The pulmonary orifice guarded by the pulmonary valve, Fig 18.12. 1. The interior of the INFL owing part shows trabeculi carriero or muscular ridges of three types A ridges or fixed elevations. B bridges. A pillars or capillary muscles with one end attached to the ventricular wall, and the other end connected to the cusps of the tricuspid valve by cordi tendineae, Latin strings to stretch. There are three papillary muscles in the right ventricle, anterior, posterior, and septal. The anterior muscle is the largest. Fig 18.12. The posterior or inferior muscle is small and irregular. The septal muscle is divided into a number of little nipples. Each papillary muscle is attached by cordi tendineae to the contiguous sides of two cusps. 2. The septomarginal trabecula or moderator band is a muscular ridge extending from the ventricular septum to the base of the anterior papillary muscle. It contains the right branch of the AV bundle. 3. The cavity of the right ventricle is crescentic in section because of the forward bulge or the interventricular septum. 1. The wall of the right ventricle is thinner than that of the left ventricle in a ratio of 1 colon 3. Interventricular septum. The septum is placed obliquely. Its one surface faces forwards and to the right and the other faces backwards and to the left. The upper part of the septum is thin and membranous and separates not only the two ventricles but also the right atrium and left ventricle. The lower part is thick muscular and separates the two ventricles. Its position is indicated by the anterior and posterior interventricular grooves, Fig 18.15. Dissection. Cut off the pulmonary trunk and ascending aorta, immediately above the three cusps of the pulmonary and aortic valves. Remove the upper part of the left atrium to visualize its interior, Fig 18.29b. See the upper surface of the cusps of the mitral valve. Revise the fact that left atrium forms the anterior wall of the oblique sinus of the pericardium, Fig 18.5. Position. The left atrium is a quadrangular chamber situated posteriorly. Its appendage, the left auricle projects anteriorly to overlap the infundibulum of the right ventricle. The left atrium forms the left two-thirds of the base of the heart, the greater part of the upper border, parts of the sternocostal and left surfaces and of the left border. It receives oxygenated blood from the lungs through four pulmonary veins, and pumps it to the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular or bicuspid, 
Latin two tooth point, or mitral orifice, Latin like bishop's mitre, which is guarded by the valve of the same name. Features 1. The posterior surface of the atrium forms the anterior wall of the oblique sinus of pericardium. 2. The anterior wall of the atrium is formed by the interatrial septum. 3. Two pulmonary veins open into the atrium on each side of the posterior wall. 4. The greater part of the interior of the atrium is smooth-walled. It is derived embryologically from the absorbed pulmonary veins which open into it. Musculi pectinati are present only in the auricle where they form a reticulum. This part develops from the original primitive atrial chamber of the heart tube. The septal wall shows the fossa lunata corresponding to the fossa ovalis of the right atrium. In addition to the four pulmonary veins, the tributaries of the atrium include a few vena cordis minimi. Table 18.2 compares the right atrium and the left atrium. Dissection Open the left ventricle by making a bold incision on the ventricular aspect of atrioventricular groove below left auricle and along whole thickness of left ventricle from above downwards till its apex. Curve the incision towards right till the inferior end of anterior interventricular groove. Reflect the flap to the right and clean the atrioventricular and aortic valves, Fig 18.10. Remove the surface layers of the myocardium. Note the general directions of its fibers and the depth of the coronary sulcus, the wall of the atrium passing deep to the bulging ventricular muscle. Dissect the musculature and the conducting system of the heart. Position The left ventricle receives oxygenated blood from the left atrium and pumps it into the aorta. It forms the apex of the heart, a part of the sternocostal surface, most of the left border and left surface, and the left two-thirds of the diaphragmatic surface, figs 18.7 and 18.8. .8. Features 1. Externally, the left ventricle has three surfaces anterior or sternocostal, irifereter or diaphragmatic, and left. 2. The interior is divisible into two parts. A. The lower rough part with trabeculae carnii develops from the primitive ventricle of the heart tube, fig 18.16. B. The upper smooth part or aortic vestibule gives origin to the ascending aorta, it develops from the mid portion of the bulbous cortis. The vestibule lies between the membranous part of the interventricular septum and the anterior or aortic cusp of the mitral valve. 3. The interior of the ventricle shows two orifices. A. The left atrioventricular or bicuspid or mitral orifice, guarded by the bicuspid or mitral valve. B. The aortic orifice, guarded by the aortic valve, fig 18.15, is the largest, fig 18.12. The posterior or inferior muscle is small and irregular. The septal muscle is divided into a number of little nipples. Each papillary muscle is attached by cordae tendineae to the contiguous sides of two cusps, fig 18.13. 3. The septomarginal trabecula or moderator band is a muscular ridge extending from the ventricular septum to the base of the anterior papillary muscle. It contains the right branch of the AV bundle, figs 18.12 and 18.14. 4. The cavity of the right ventricle is crescentic in section because of the forward bulge of the interventricular septum, fig 18.15. 3. The wall of the right ventricle is thinner than that of the left ventricle in a ratio of 1 colon 3. Interventricular septum. The septum is placed obliquely. Its one surface faces forwards and to the right and the other faces backwards and to the left. The upper part of the septum is thin and membranous and separates not only the two ventricles but also the right atrium and left ventricle. The lower part is thick muscular and separates the two ventricles. Its position is indicated by the anterior and posterior interventricular grooves, fig 18.15. Dissection. Cut off the pulmonary trunk and ascending aorta, immediately above the three cusps of the pulmonary and aortic valves. Remove the upper part of the left atrium to visualize its interior, fig 18.29b. See the upper surface of the cusps of the mitral valve. Revise the fact that left atrium forms the anterior wall of the oblique sinus of the pericardium, fig 18.5. Position the left atrium is a quadrangular chamber situated posteriorly. Its appendage, 
the Jeff auricle projects anteriorly to overlap the infundibulum of the right ventricle. The left atrium forms the left two-thirds of the base of the heart, the greater part of the upper border, parts of the sternocostal and left surfaces and of the left border. It receives oxygenated blood from the lungs through four pulmonary veins, and pumps it to the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular or bicuspid, Latin who tooth point, or mitral orifice, Latin like bishop's mitre, which is guarded by the valve of the same name. Features 1 The posterior surface of the atrium forms the anterior wall of the oblique sinus of pericardium, fig 18.5. 2. The anterior wall of the atrium is formed by the interatrial septum. 3. The anterior wall of the atrium is formed by the interatrial septum. 4. Two pulmonary veins open into the atrium on each side of the posterior wall. 5. The greater part of the interior of the atrium is smooth-walled. It is derived embryologically from the absorbed pulmonary veins which open into it. Musculi pectinati are present only in the auricle where they form a reticulum. This part develops from the original primitive atrial chamber of the heart tube. The septal wall shows the fossa lunata corresponding to the fossa ovalis of the right atrium. In addition to the four pulmonary veins, the tributaries of the atrium include a few veni cordis minimi. Table 18.2 compares the right atrium and left atrium. Dissection Open the left ventricle by making a bold incision on the ventricular aspect of atrioventricular groove below left auricle and along whole thickness of left ventricle from above downwards till its apex. Curve the incision towards right till the inferior end of anterior interventricular groove. Reflect the flap to the right and clean the atrioventricular and aortic valves, fig 18.10. Remove the surface layers of the myocardium. Note the general directions of its fibers and the depth of the coronary sulcus, the wall of the atrium passing deep to the bulging ventricular muscle. Dissect the musculature and the conducting system of the heart. Position The left ventricle receives oxygenated blood from the left atrium and pumps it into the aorta. It forms the apex of the heart, a part of the sternocostal surface, most of the left border and left surface, and the left two-thirds of the diaphragmatic surface, figs 18.7 and 18.8. Features 1. Externally, the left ventricle has three surfaces anterior or sternocostal, inferior or diaphragmatic, and left. 2. The interior is divisible into two parts. A. The lower rough part with trabeculae carnii develops from the primitive ventricle of the heart tube, fig 18.16. B. The upper smooth part or aortic vestibule gives origin to the ascending aorta, it develops from the mid portion of the bulbous cortis. The vestibule lies between the membranous part of the interventricular septum and the anterior or aortic cusp of the mitral valve. 3. The interior of the ventricle shows two orifices. A. The left atrioventricular or bicuspid or mitral orifice, guarded by the bicuspid or mitral valve. B. The aortic orifice guarded by the aortic valve. 4. There are two well-developed papillary muscles, anterior and posterior. Cordy tendineae from both muscles are attached to both the cusps of the mitral valve. 5. The cavity of the left ventricle is circular in cross-section, fig 18.15. 6. The walls of the left ventricle are three times thicker than those of the right ventricle. Table 18.3 compares the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The area of the chest waffle overlying the heart is called the precordium. Rapid pulse or increased heart rate is called tachycardia, Greek rapid heart. Slow pulse or decreased heart rate called bradycardia, Greek slow heart. Irregular pulse or irregular heart rate is called arrhythmia. Consciousness of 1's heartbeat is called palpitation. Inflammation of the heart can involve more than one layer of the heart. Inflammation of the pericardium is called pericarditis, of the myocardium is myocarditis, and of the endocardium is endocarditis. Normally the diastolic pressure in ventricles is zero. A positive diastolic pressure in the ventricle is evidence of its failure. Any one of the four chambers of the heart can fail separately, but ultimately the rising back pressure causes right-sided failure, congestive cardiac failure or CCF, which is associated with increased venous pressure, edema on feet, and breathlessness on exertion. 
Heart failure, right-sided, due to lung disease is known as COR pulmonal. Valves The valves of the heart maintain unidirectional flow of the blood and prevent its regurgitation in the opposite direction. There are two pairs of valves in the heart, a pair of atrioventricular valves and a pair of semilunar valves. The right atrioventricular valve is known as the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps. The left atrioventricular valve is known as the bicuspid valve because it has two cusps. It is also called the mitral valve. The semilunar valves include the aortic and pulmonary valves, each having three semilunar cusps. The cusps are folds of endocardium, strengthened by an intervening layer of fibrous tissue, Fig 18.17. Atrioventricular valves. One both valves are made up of the following components. A a fibrous ring to which the cusps are attached, Fig 18.13. B the cusps are flat and project into the ventricular cavity. Each cusp has an attached and a free margin, and an atrial and a ventricular surface. The atrial surface is smooth, Fig 18.16. The free margins and ventricular surfaces are rough and irregular due to the attachment of cordy tendineae. The valves are closed during ventricular systole, Greek contraction, by apposition of the atrial surfaces near the serrated margins. See the cordy tendineae connect the free margins and ventricular surfaces of the cusps to the apices O1 the papillary muscles. They prevent eversion of the free margins and limit the amount of ballooning of the cusps towards the cavity of the atrium. D. The atrioventricular valves are kept competent by active contraction of the papillary muscles, which pull on the cordy tendineae during ventricular systole. Each papillary muscle is connected to the contiguous halves of two cusps. Two blood vessels are present only in the fibrous ring and in the basal one-third of the cusps. Nutrition to the central two-thirds of the cusps is derived directly from the blood in the cavity of the heart. 3. The tricuspid valve has three cusps and can admit the tips of three fingers. The three cusps, the anterior, posterior or inferior, and septal lie against the three walls of the ventricle. Of the three papillary muscles, the anterior is the largest, the inferior is smaller and irregular, and the septal is represented by a number of small muscular elevations. 4. The mitral or bicuspid valve has two cusps, a large anterior or aortic cusp, and a small posterior cusp. It admits the tips of two fingers. The anterior cusp lies between the mitral and aortic orifices. The mitral cusps are smaller and thicker than those of the tricuspid valve. Semilunar valves. 1. The aortic and pulmonary valves are called semilunar valves because their cusps are semilunar in shape. Both valves are similar to each other. 2. Each valve has three cusps which are attached directly to the vessel wall, there being no fibrous ring. The cusps form small pockets with their mouths directed away from the ventricular cavity. The free margin of each cusp contains a central fibrous nodule from each side of which a thin smooth margin the lunule extends up to the base of the cusp. These unixes are closed during ventricular diastole when each cusp bulges towards the ventricular cavity. 3. Opposite the cusps the vessel walls are slightly dilated to form the aortic and pulmonary sinuses. The coronary arteries arise from the anterior and the left posterior aortic sinuses. The first heart sound is produced by closure of the atrioventricular valves. The second heart sound is produced by closure of the semilunar valves. Narrowing of the valve orifice due to fusion of the cusps is known as stenosis, vis mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, etc. Dilatation of the valve orifice, or stiffening of the cusps causes imperfect closure of the valve leading to backflow of blood. This is known as incompetence or regurgitation, e.g. aortic incompetence or aortic regurgitation fibrous skeleton. The fibrous rings surrounding the atrioventricular and arterial orifices, along with some adjoining masses of fibrous tissue, constitute the fibrous skeleton of the heart. It provides attachment to the cardiac muscle and keeps the cardiac valve competent. The atrioventricular fibrous rings are in the form of the figure of 8. The atria, the ventricles and the membranous part of the interventricular septum are attached to them. 
there is no muscular continuity between the atria and ventricles across the rings except for the atrioventricular bundle or bundle of his. There is large mass of fibrous tissue between the atrioventricular rings behind and the aortic ring in front. It is known as the trigonum fibrosum dextrum. In some mammals like sheep, a small bone the os cortis is present in this mass of fibrous tissue. Another smaller mass of fibrous tissue is present between the aortic and mitral rings. It is known as the trigonum fibrosum sinicerdum. The tendon of the infundibulum, close to pulmonary valve, binds the posterior surface of the infundibulum to the aortic ring. Musculotour of the heart. Cardiac muscle fibers form long loops which are attached to the fibrous skeleton. Upon contraction of the muscular loops, the blood from the cardiac chambers is wrung out like water from a wet cloth. The atrial fibers are arranged in a superficial transverse layer and a deep anteroposterior, vertical, layer. The ventricular fibers are arranged in superficial and deep layers. The superficial fibers arise from skeleton of the heart to undergo a spiral course. First these pass across the inferior surface, wind round the lower border and then across the sternocostal surface to reach the apex of heart, where these fibers form a vortex and continue with the deep layer. Superficial fibers are, A fibers start from tendon of infundibulum, 1, pass across the diaphragmatic surface, curve around inferior border to reach the sternocostal surface. Then these fibers cross the anterior interventricular groove to reach the apex, where these form a vortex and end in anterior papillary muscle of left ventricle, Fig 18.21a. B fibers arise from right AV ring take same course as, 2, but end in posterior papillary muscle. C fibers arise from left AV ring, lie along the diaphragmatic surface, cross the posterior interventricular groove to reach the papillary muscles of right ventricle. D deep fibers are S-shaped. These arise from papillary muscle of one ventricle, turn in interventricular groove, to end in papillary muscle of other ventricle. Fibers of first layer circle RV, cross through interventricular septum and end in papillary muscle of LV layers 2 and 3 have decreasing course in RV and increasing course in LV, Fig 18.21c. Conducting System the conducting system is made up of myocardium that is specialized for initiation and conduction of the cardiac impulse. Its fibers are finer than other myocardial fibers, and are completely cross-striated. The conducting system has the following parts. One sinuatrial node or SA node, it is known as the pacemaker of the heart. It generates impulses at the rate of about 7100 beats slash min and initiates the heartbeat. It is horseshoe shaped and is situated at the atriocaval junction in the upper part of the sulcus terminals. The impulse travels through the atrial wall to reach the AV node. 2. Atrioventricular node or avenue node, it is smaller than the SA node and is situated in the lower and dorsal part of the atrial septum just above the opening of the coronary sinus. It is capable of generating impulses at a rate of about 40 to 60 beats slash min. 3. Atrioventricular bundle or avenue bundle or again bundle of his, it is the only muscular connection between the atrial and ventricular musculatures. It begins as the atrioventricular, AV, node crosses AV ring and descends along the postero-inferior border of the membranous part of the ventricular septum. At the upper border of the muscular part of the septum, it divides into right and left branches. For the right breach of the AV bundle passes down the right side of the interventricular septum. A large part enters the moderator band to reach the anterior wall of the right ventricle where it divides into Purkinje fibers. 5. The left branch of the AV bundle descends on the left side of the interventricular septum and is distributed to the left ventricle after dividing into Purkinje fibers. 6. The Parkinga fibers form a subendocardial plexus. They are large pale fibers striated only at their margins. They usually possess double nuclei. These generate impulses at the rate of 20-35 beats slash minute. Defects of or damage to conducting system results in cardiac arrhythmias, i.e. defects in the normal rhythm of contraction. Except for a part of the left branch of the AV bundle supplied by the left coronary artery, the whole of the conducting system is usually supplied by the right coronary artery. 
vascular lesions of the heart can cause a variety of arrhythmias. Arteries supplying the heart. The heart is supplied by two coronary arteries, arising from the ascending aorta. Both arteries run in the coronary sulcus. Right coronary artery. Dissection. Carefully remove the fat from the coronary sulcus. Identify the right coronary artery in the depth of the right part of the atrioventricular sulcus. Trace the right coronary artery superiorly to its origin from the right aortic sinus and inferiorly till it turns onto the posterior surface of the heart to lie in its atrioventricular sulcus. It gives off the posterior interventricular branch which is seen in posterior interventricular groove. The right coronary artery ends by anastomosing with the circumflex branch of left coronary artery or by dipping itself deep in the myocardium there. Position Right coronary artery is smaller than the left coronary artery. It arises from the anterior aortic sinus, figs 18.22 a and b, of ascending aorta course. L it first passes forwards and to the right to emerge on the surface of the heart between the root of the pulmonary trunk and the right auricle. 2 it then runs downwards in the right anterior coronary sulcus to the junction of the right and inferior borders of the heart. 3 it winds round the inferior border to reach the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. Here it runs backwards and to the left in the right posterior coronary sulcus to reach the posterior interventricular groove. 4 it terminates by anastomosing with the circumflex branch of left coronary artery at the crux. Branches, large branches, amarginal. 2 posterior interventricular. Small branches, anodal. In 60% cases, B right atrial, C infundibular, D terminal, E right ventricular, F conus, area distribution 1 right atrium point 2 ventricles. A greater part of the right ventricle, except the area adjoining the anterior interventricular groove. B a small part of the left ventricle adjoining the posterior interventricular groove. 2 posterior part of the interventricular septum. 3 whole of the conducting system of the heart except a part of the left branch of the AV bundle. The SA node is supplied by the left coronary artery in about 40% of cases. Left coronary artery dissection. Strip the visceral pericardium from the sternocostal surface of the heart. Expose the anterior interventricular branch of the left coronary artery and the great cardiac vein by carefully removing the fat from the anterior interventricular sulcus. Note the branches of the artery to both ventricles and to the interventricular septum which lies deep to it. Trace the artery inferiorly to the diaphragmatic surface and superiorly to the left of the pulmonary trunk. Trace the circumflex branch of left coronary artery on the left border of heart into the posterior part of the sulcus, where it may end by anastomosing with the right coronary artery or by dipping into the myocardium position. Left coronary artery is larger than the right coronary artery. It arises from the left posterior aortic sinus of ascending aortic. Course. 1. The artery first runs forwards and to the left and emerges between the pulmonary trunk and the left auricle. Here it gives the anterior interventricular branch which runs downwards in the groove of the same name. The further continuation of the left coronary artery is called the circumflex artery. 2. After giving off the anterior interventricular branch the artery runs to the left in the left anterior coronary sulcus. 3. It winds round the left border of the heart and continues in the left posterior coronary sulcus. Near the posterior interventricular groove it terminates by anastomosing with the right coronary artery. Branches large branches. A anterior interventricular. B. Branches to the diaphragmatic surface of the left ventricle including a large diagonal branch. Two small branches, A left atrial, B pulmonary, C terminal area of distribution. One left atrium point two ventricles A greater part of the left ventricle, except the area adjoining the posterior interventricular groove. B a small part of the right ventricle adjoining the anterior interventricular groove. Two anterior part of the interventricular septum, fig 18.24. 3A part of the left branch of the AV bundle. Cardiac dominance. In about 10 asterisk N of hearts, 
the right coronary is rather small and is not able to give the posterior interventricular branch. In these cases the circumflex artery, the continuation of left coronary provides the posterior interventricular branch as well as to the AV node. Such cases are called left dominant. Mostly the right coronary given posterior interventricular artery. Such hearts are right dominant. Thus the artery giving the posterior interventricular branch is the dominant artery. Collateral circulation. Corchiac anastomosis the two coronary arteries anastomose with each other in myocardium. Extracorchiac anastomosis. The coronary arteries anastomose with the following, one vasa vasorum of the aorta. Two vasa vasorum of the pulmonary arteries. Three the internal thoracic arteries. 4. The bronchial arteries. 5. The phrenic arteries. The last three anastomose through the pericardium. These channels may open up in emergencies when both coronary arteries are obstructed. Retrograde flow of blood in the reins may irrigate the myocardium. These anastomoses are of little tactical value. They are not able to provide an alternative source of blood in case of blockage of a branch of a coronary. Blockage of arteries or coronary thrombosis usually leads to death of myocardium. The condition is called myocardial infarction. Thrombosis of coronary artery is a common cause of sudden death in persons past middle age. This is due to myocardial infarction and ventricular fibrillation, Fig 18.25. Incomplete obstruction, usually due to spasm of the coronary artery causes angina pectoris, which is associated with agonizing pain in the precordial region and down the medial side of the left arm and forearm, Fig 18.26. Pain gets relieved by putting appropriate tablets below the tongue. Coronary angiography determines the site, S, of narrowing or occlusion of the coronary arteries or their branches. Angioplasty helps in removal of small blockage. It is done using small stent or small inflated balloon through a catheter passed upwards through femoral artery, aorta, into the coronary artery. If there are large segments or multiple sites of blockage, coronary bypass is done using either great saphenous vein or internal thoracic artery as graft, S. These are the great cardiac vein, the middle cardiac vein, the right marginal vein, the posterior vein of the left ventricle, the oblique vein of the left atrium, the anterior cardiac veins, and the vena cordis minimi. All veins except the last two drain into the coronary sinus which opens into the right atrium. The anterior cardiac veins and the vena cordis minimi open directly into the right atrium. Coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is the largest vein of the heart. It is situated in the left posterior coronary sulcus. It is about 3 cm long. It ends by opening into the posterior wall of the right atrium. It receives the following tributaries 1. The great cardiac rein accompanies first the anterior interventricular artery and then the left coronary artery to enter the left end of the coronary sinus. 2. The middle cardiac rein accompanies the posterior interventricular artery and joins the middle part of the coronary sinus. 3. The smell cardiac vein accompanies the right coronary artery in the right posterior coronary sulcus and joins the right end of the coronary sinus. The right marginal vein may drain into the small cardiac vein. 4. The posterior vein of the left ventricle runs on the diaphragmatic surface of the left ventricle and ends in the coronary sinus. 5. The oblique vein of the left atrium of Marshall is a small vein running on the posterior surface of the left atrium. It terminates in the left end of the coronary sinus. It develops from the left common cardinal vein or duct of Cuvier which may sometimes form a large left superior vena cava. 6. The right marginal vein accompanies the marginal branch of the right coronary artery. It may either drain into the small cardiac vein, or may open directly into the right atrium. Anterior cardiac veins. The anterior cardiac veins are three or four small veins which run parallel to one another on the anterior wall of the right ventricle and usually open directly into the right atrium through its anterior wall. Vena cordis minimi. The vena cordis minimi or Thebesian reins or smallest cardiac reins are numerous small valveless veins present in all four chambers of the heart which open directly into the cavity. These are more numerous on the right side of the heart than on the left. 
This may be one reason why left-sided infarcts are more common. Lymphatics of heart. Lymphatics of the heart accompany the coronary arteries and form two trunks. The right trunk ends in the brachiocephalic nodes, and the left trunk ends in the tracheobronchial lymph nodes at the bifurcation of the trachea. Nerve supply of heart. Parasympathetic nerves reach the heart via the vagus. These are cardio-inhibitory, on stimulation they slow down the heart rate. Sympathetic nerves are derived from the upper 4 to 5 thoracic segments of the spinal cord. These are cardio-acceleratory, and on stimulation they increase the heart rate, and also dilate the coronary arteries. Both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves form the superficial and deep cardiac plex uses, the branches of which run along the coronary arteries to reach the myocardium. The superior cardiac plexus is situated below the arch of the aorta in front of the right pulmonary artery. It is formed by a the superior cervical cardiac branch of the left sympathetic chain, b the inferior cervical cardiac branch of the left vagus nerve. The plexus is connected to the deep cardiac plexus, the right coronary artery, and to the left anterior pulmonary plexus. The deep cardiac plexus is situated in front of the bifurcation of the trachea, and behind the arch of the aorta. It is formed by all the cardiac branches derived from all the cervical and upper thoracic ganglia of the sympathetic chain, and the cardiac branches of the vagus and recurrent laryngeal nerves, except those which form the superficial plexus. The right and left halves of the plexus distribute branches to the corresponding coronary and pulmonary plex uses. Separate branches are given to the atria. Cardiac pain is an ischemic pain caused by incomplete obstruction of a coronary artery. Axons of pain fibers conveyed by the sensory sympathetic cardiac nerves reach thoracic 1 to thoracic 5 segments of spinal cord mostly through the dorsal root ganglia of the left side. Since these dorsal root ganglia also receive sensory impulses from the medial side of arm, forearm and upper part of front of chest, the pain gets referred to these areas as depicted in Fig 18.26. Though the pain is usually referred to the left side, it may even be referred to right arm, jaw, epigastrium, or back. Developmental Components One right atrium a rough anterior part atrial chamber proper. B smooth posterior part absorption of right horn of sinus venosus. Interatrial septum. Demarcating part crist terminalis. 2 left atrium, a rough part atrial chamber proper. B smooth part, absorption of pulmonary veins. Interatrial septum. A right ventricle rough part proximal portion of bulbous cordis a smooth part the conus cordis or middle portion of bulbous cordis. 1 left ventricle, fig 18.16, a rough part hole of primitive ventricular chamber. B the conus cordis or the middle portion of bulbous cordis forms the smooth part. 2 interatrial septum a septum primum fossa ovalis b septum secundum limbus fossa ovalis 3 interventricular septum a thick muscular in lower part by the two ventricles b thin membranous in upper part by fusion of inferior atrioventricular cushion and right and left conus swelling membranous part not only separates the two ventricles but also separates right atrium from left ventricle 4 truncus arteriosus or distal part of bulbous cordis forms the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk, as separated by spiral septum. Spiral septum is responsible for triple relation of ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. At the beginning pulmonary trunk is anterior to ascending aorta, then it is to the left and finally the right pulmonary artery is posterior to ascending aorta, fig 18.10. Heart is fully functional at the end of second month of intrauterine life. The foetus, Greek, spring, is dependent for its entire nutrition on the mother, and this is achieved through the placenta attached to the uterus. As the lungs are not functioning, the blood needs to bypass the pulmonary circuit. The oxygenated blood reaches the foetus through the single umbilical vein. This vein containing oxygenated blood traverses the umbilical cord to reach the liver. The oxygenated blood bypasses the liver via the ductus venosus to join inferior vena cava. As inferior vena cava drains into the right atrium, the oxygenated and nutrient-rich blood brought by it enters the right atrium. 
then it passes into the left atrium through foramen ovale, thus bypassing the pulmonary circuit, figs 18.31 and 18.32. From the left atrium it enters the left ventricle and traverses the systemic circuit via the ascending aorta, arch of aorta and descending thoracic and descending abdominal aorta. The last mentioned vessel divides into common iliac arteries. Each common iliac artery terminates by dividing into external and internal iliac arteries. Arising from two internal iliac arteries are the two umbilical arteries which in turn pass through the umbilical cord to end in the placenta. The deoxygenated blood from the viscera, lower limbs, head and neck and upper limbs also enters the right atrium via both the inferior and superior vena cava. This venous blood gains entry into the right ventricle and leaves it via the pulmonary trunk and left pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery is joined to the left end of arch of aorta via the ductus arteriosus. Thus the venous blood traversing through the left pulmonary artery and ductus arteriosus enters the left end of arch of aorta. So the descending thoracic and abdominal aorta get mixed blood. At the internal iliac end it passes via the two umbilical arteries to reach the placenta for oxygenation. So for bypassing the lungs and for providing oxygen and nutrition to the developing embryo and foetus, the following structures had to be improvised. A1 umbilical vein. B ductus venosus. C foramen ovale. D ductus arteriosus. E2 umbilical arteries. At the time of birth, with the start of breathing process, these structures, 1 5, retrogress and gradually the adult form of circulation takes over. Changes at birth, A lung start functioning. B umbilical vein forms ligamentum teres. D ductus venous forms ligamentum venosum. E foramen ovale closes. F ductus arteriosus forms ligamentum arteriosum. G umbilical arteries form medial umbilical ligaments mnemonics heart valves tri pulling my aorta tricuspid, pulmonary mitral aorta. Heart is a pump for pushing blood to the lungs and for rest of the organs of the body. Due to sympathetic stimulation it is felt thumping against the chest wall. All the components of left ventricle are thicker as it has to push the blood from top of head to the toes of foot. Left atrium forms most of the base of the heart. Coronary arteries are functional end arteries. Pain of heart due to myocardial infarction is referred to left side of chest between 3rd and 6th intercostal spaces. It also get extended to medial side of left upper limb in the area of distribution of C8 and T1 spinal segments.